I know we are. We're actually four minutes late. All right, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to call tonight's meeting to order. Um, tonight's a very special meeting. It's the open forum. Should get interesting. We have a very, at least one page, and I'm sure there might be one or two more where we can uh, hear from the public. But first, let's do a roll call and a pledge. Mayor Bagley? Here. Council Members Christensen? Here. Finley? Here. Martin? Here. Peck? Here. Rodriguez? Here. Mary of a quorum? It's a pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, we've got a, a busy meeting tonight, not with the usual business, but hearing and discussing things and matters that are of interest with um, all y'all. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, I'm going to call you down one at a time, but I'm going to tell you we'll, we'll kind of cue it. And so uh, maybe if it's if you're coming up, I'll, I'm going to call three. First person come to the podium, and then when they're done, I'll keep calling one and just come down and sit in that front row if that's okay. And we can just kind of move along like that. So let's start off with Mr. John Coe. And then uh, after that, it's Marianne Riggi. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. R-I-G-I-H-I. Riggi. Okay. And then uh, Mr. Kenworthy. James Kenworthy. Where are you? There he is. So uh, if you could come down and just sit in the front row there, and we'll uh, get going. All right. You're up. Well, thank you, and we'll have a bunch of people on bat here. My name is John Coe, and I'm at 1899 Third Avenue. So uh, thank you, Council, for serving. And uh, I'd just like to, uh, um, uh, I guess I'm not really trying to catch you up on my week, but I wanted to tell you more about the water meeting that I went to because it was fascinating to me because, uh, and I actually just had a chance to talk to two of the Council members, but uh, uh, one of the strange restrictions on my water share is that it, it's restricted on pumping. They don't want the water to be pumped uphill. I guess that changes things. But I can do as much downhill as I want, and I really want to generate electricity from it, so that's no restriction at all. So anyway, I went to this water meeting, and I found this strange fact. They said I couldn't pump water to my front yard, but I could, pump, I could have water downhill. And uh, literally some of my downhill neighbors I'm hoping to distribute water to or maybe some, do some kind of a, a deal with. Um, you know, as, as per the water laws. Uh, but I wanted to share that with you and also kind of go over, this is actually kind of my diagram for connecting up when I have to work with the ditch company and the ditch company is highly, you know, integrated with the city, of course. Uh, I want to also share just kind of a couple things. Um, I uh, had a chance to like go over some information and one of the uh, topics is the airport information. And I, I want to go over that briefly, and I printed up a T-shirt, and I actually had given some people some T-shirts over this. And really what it kind of comes down to is the operations of the airport are fairly noisy because of the otters and those aircraft. And if we were able to share some of the, uh, air, some of the jump operations with other air, airports, that would potentially make it, and maybe even get glider operations in this area, that might make it so we can have some quiet days. And I've actually looked at the, uh, the charts, and I know this is a little bit impromptu here, but, but basically what it comes down to is our main highway is kind of a corridor for aircraft uh, to come down to. So it really kind of comes down to them slicing up the lower part of the sky, and the sky up against the foothills are, is the area that uh, could potentially be used. And there's some small airports up further north from here. So potentially the city could uh, embrace those airports and try and get jump operations there and potentially glider operations shared with Boulder as a much quieter uh, alternative. Um, I go to you know conferences on geographical information and uh, just to get back to the water, I realized after I got to this conference this year that uh, I could have spent uh, three days at this two-day conference just following the water track because there's all kinds of water laws that are um, very interesting and I just kind of bought this as a commodity but it uh, it was really nice that I was able to interface with the city and get information from them. And I think we're on a five-minute schedule tonight, but I'm not going to go the whole time. So thank you very much for your service, and thank you. Thanks, Mr. Coe. Marianne Righeye, and then uh, if Michael Farnsworth could come down, and you're on deck. Or not on deck, you're one back from on deck. I don't know exactly what the baseball term would be for almost on deck. 
You're good in the evening. dugout. Get ready. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I've spoken before on these subjects, and I'd like to bring them up again. I'm a resident of Aspen Meadows Apartments in Longmont, Colorado, and it's a very nice place, and I like being there. And it's a senior residence, and I'm glad that I got senior residency in Longmont. I've been here uh, two and three years, almost three and a half years, and Longmont's a very nice place. And I was in Boulder before, and I really like Boulder too, so I like Boulder County. <laughs> but um, what I'd like to say is that um, I want to bring up what I feel, my opinion on the need for a homeless shelter, I brought it up before in Longmont, and a permanent one, because um, uh, we, I'm involved in volunteer work with uh, the Agape program, and it's wonderful, and the people are wonderful, and I, uh, I'm not changing the subject, but it's related, and um, there are seven churches involved now, and ours is one of them, and every night of the week, um, the homeless are taken into different churches, and it's a great program, and uh, we go on Sunday nights, my friends and I, and volunteer to sit and talk with homeless people and also to listen to their stories. I hope I'm not causing anybody any hearing problems. <laughs> I, I hear some thumping. I, I'm sorry about this, uh, how I'm talking into the microphone. But um, uh, the, there's, a, I see a need. Um, I was homeless at one time myself, and I see a need for um, there to be a homeless shelter year round because um, in Boulder there is one and um, some of the things that that uh, h helps people with who are without a residence is that um, during the day there's a need uh, for there to be shelter even uh, though the the greatest need is at night and during the winter, but on uh, other months of the year, um, there are spiders that bite and there is a, a possibility of sunburn and dehydration and different things that can happen to people that are homeless that people may not think about. So that's one, those are the major reasons I see the need. And um, um, once again, I want to say good things about Agape. There are cots now that are set up for the homeless, and that is so important for people to have uh, a good uh, support for their backs when they're sleeping, and there is food provided by volunteers. But um, I'd like to bring something else up, too, and use up my five minutes if I can. <laughs> and the other uh, thing I'd like to bring up is the need for seat belts in RTD buses. Um, I was injured in two RTD buses, and one I was thrown from my seat and fell on the floor and uh, injured my leg and my spine. More so, I already had a, um, in, I already had a, um, uh, problem with my leg and I was already using a walker. But since I was riding as a disabled person on an RGD bus, um, I didn't have a helper with me. And a helper really helps because they can speak up for you when something isn't right. So um, I have seen the need for for seat belts. And um, I got good news today. I want to fit this in if I can from a call and ride driver who told me that he, he knows, he, this is hearsay, but he knows that in call and ride, they're going to have, definitely have seat belts in all the call and ride uh, vans uh, within the next five years. Now this is hearsay, like I said, from one call and ride driver, but he said that it helps when the um, contractors like them, the employees, speak up for their passengers because there is a need for protection that people aren't thrown from their seats when the bus driver or van driver has to come to an abrupt stop. And I think I'm almost probably used up my time, but I wanted to say again how grateful I am to everyone who's offered me assistance through, through the years, the past five years I've lived in Colorado, and I want to say how grateful I am that I'm in a senior residence once again, and it's very nice, and I really love Longmont. It's a very nice place, and I like coming to the meetings and sharing, and thank you very much. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, Stan Toll, if you could come on down. And then Mr. Kenworthy, you're up. You're passing? Okay, all right. You're up. Yeah, hold on, Stan. It's, you're, you're up two, two more. It's Mr. Kenworthy's turn. Sorry. A little confusing tonight. Do I, do I need to introduce myself? Maybe. Go ahead. Uh, James Kenworthy, 107 Caribou Place. 
Uh, there have been two fracking accidents since the uh, in the last part of December. Three men went to the, two workers went to the hospital. One of them died from his burns, so it was a matter he burned to death. And uh, there have been no uh, reactions of any kind from Weld County, except for the fire marshal in New Raymer, who's afraid he's going to run out of uh, firefighting foam. And Boulder County needs to be prepared for this kind of uh, activity. And what I wonder, has there been any contact between city council members and any of the county commissioners about this issue? None? We need some. We need to put some pressure on the city, uh, on the county commissioners. They say their hands are tied. Usually when people's hands are tied, they try to get loose, but they're not trying to get loose. They're just, uh, it's very convenient for them to say they have uh, no ability to do anything. So I hope that uh, some of the city council members will consider talking to county commissioners and maybe stirring them up, stirring them up a little bit and uh, have them get with the program. So I'm done. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Kenworthy. Uh, Cody Gardner, if you could come down, and Michael Farnsworth, he's after him. Michael Farnsworth, 25 College Court, Longmont. Um, just a sidebar to what I was going to speak on. I believe the two accidents weren't fracking problems, they were storage problems. And the, there was two men that were killed, or one was killed and the other was burned. Both of them burned, I guess. But uh, that wasn't a fracking problem, excuse me. All right. Uh, I'm here to talk about the Kiowa. Uh, I haven't got that right. Um, Kakua, thank you. Kakua uh, of his owning. Uh, I think that that is a um, situation that we should try to rectify, the council should try to rectify and get that zoning uh, set up properly. I wish the council would reconsider that vote. Uh, I know there was two, two votes for, Mayor, you were one, to have that zoned properly. And uh, I think that that facility is a great idea. This will bring about 60 to 70 maybe 80 jobs to town uh, of all varieties, both doctors, counselors, teachers, for these young men. And these young men are not, uh, they have been exposed and using drugs, and this will be a facility that accepts no court-ordered youth. It will be strictly voluntary youth, and they will be there for approximately six months. They will also have a school there. They will have an a, uh, ability to uh, school these youngsters and give them credits for those that schooling. Uh, I was looking at that address and uh, the vacant lot, lot next to it. I don't really see an issue on property values as was brought up. Somebody felt that that would devalue property around it. Uh, at the moment, what it looks like most of that property is going to be uh, apartment houses. Um, these young men will be taught and shown how they can straighten themselves out and be able to become uh, the citizens and young people that their parents would be proud of.
as I understand, the zoning is for a uh, conditional use. And if that's correct, then that should not create any problems in the future because if somebody wants to go into that same zoning, they'll have to meet that conditional use zoning. Now, I'm not an expert in zoning by any stretch of the imagination, but I do believe that that is the correct way that it should be looked at. I'm an older citizen in Longmont. I came to Longmont in the sixth grade in 1949. I have watched this town grow from what I was told was 11,000 in 1949. I sold papers on Main Street on Saturday night when the town grew in size twice. There would be tw 15 to 20,000 people in Longmont that night. On Saturday night, they came to town to buy their groceries, to go to the show, buy their clothes, and then they would go back out to their farms. I watched I-25 being built. I can remember 1955 that you could drive down I-25 to 19th Street in Denver, and that's as far as it went. My, my wife is a native of Colorado, fourth generation native. So I have been here um, okay. a long been, time. A long thank time. You, thank you very and much I, for your I would remarks. like to see this All right, vote thank changed. You. All right, Stanley Toll. And I'll just call you out one at a time because it seems to take more time queuing them up. Sorry, staff. All right. Um, Mayor Brian Bagley and council, uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity to uh, express ourselves. Uh, I'm Stan Toll. I'm a longtime resident of the city of Lonmont. Um, what I was going to um, uh, present to the council just briefly, and I haven't really reviewed this, I just basically put some notes, but there was an article in the Atlantic, and it's concerning 50 years of white backlash. And to, um, as we all know, that yesterday was the celebration of Martin Luther King's birthday. One of the things we have to, I think we need to remember that Martin Luther King was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. And after that assassination, Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Fair Housing Act. Now, just get the mic up, up real close. Oh, to you, okay. Man. That, yeah, that's almost, I don't want to pop, so. <laughs> okay, so, like, this was almost the beginning of what can be described as the white uh, backlash. Five years after this Fair Housing Act was enacted, um, the Justice, the Justice Department investigated and brought charges against a New York developer and his son. They finally settled in 1975 after a huge, very public uh, legal battle. This is our introduction to the present president. Donald Trump. So this is not, you know, well, well, the back, the white backlash was not just people like this. It came in all sorts of forms. Like if we remember the history here, when there was uh, desegregation orders, the white flight. The other thing that happened, there is also a lot of local laws put in, specifically 
kind of to get around a lot of these uh, things. What, I, what I'd like to bring up is issues of local concern. Last year, I basically got called because I'm sort of set up to do a certain amount of uh, mobile mechanic work. I got called um, to somebody that I knew, and it seems that their their little van, since it was five below zero that night, wouldn't start for them in the morning. And what was going on here is that we had a woman, her boyfriend, and two kids staying in a van. This was not a case of both the both of the adults were working full time. The problem they were having with their housing was discrimination. One of them, actually it was the woman, had a, a domestic um, hit, uh, indication on her on her background. And so what was happening is they had been putting in applications, and they were being charged, let's say, I'm not sure how much, but they were charging, being charged application fees for each person, for herself, for the two kids, and for, for the man. And they were being rejected, and then their, their application fee was not being returned. And they were doing that over and over and over again. And what I would like to point out, I went to a housing forum. I don't know exactly what you'd call it, but essentially it was for landlords. And it was somebody from, um, I'm not sure if she was from, from uh, you know, the housing agency or what it was. But anyway, to make it quick. Uh, that's, i, I got to cut you off. But thank you, though, Mr. Toole. All right, Cody Gardner. Let's see if I can get this right. <clears throat> Is that about good? Yep. All right, thanks, uh, council members, Mr. Mayor, for having us. I, uh, Cody Gardner, I'm a uh, longtime resident, small business owner here in town. I actually run a treatment center. I wanted to come in for support for cocoa recovery and the zoning issue that was heard a little bit ago. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit, just for a few minutes, about sort of myself and what I understand about this epidemic that we're in in this country. Uh, I am a person in long-term recovery. What that means is I haven't had a drink or a drug since September 22nd of 2006. Uh, my wife is in long-term recovery. Uh, we're raising our kids in a household that does not have alcohol, uh, and we were all given that by treatment. Um, I was intervened upon as an adolescent. My parents did not know what to do. Um, Thus, I ended up seeing a therapist and a psychiatrist, but I never really got clear about uh, where my life was going to head. And at 23 years old, uh, another intervention happened, and I ended up uh, going to treatment, staying for uh, about six months, and I've got my life back. Uh, married, kids, career. I've moved all over the country. Um, I was also a probation officer here in Boulder County for about four years, uh, Boulder and Denver counties uh, both. And I worked with people with substance use disorder in the drug court. I worked with judges. Um, and I don't understand the whole zoning issue, but I want to urge the committee, the council, uh, Mr. Mayor, to, to relook at this. Uh, we are in the worst epidemic this country has ever faced in terms of public health. It has been deemed uh, the worst public health crisis of this generation. Uh, it has, at its peak, has surpassed the AIDS epidemic in terms of fatalities. Uh, the most recent numbers in September in 2016 are that uh, 65,000 people died from opiates, 88,000 people died from alcohol. The uh, life expectancy in this country has actually been lowered as a direct result of this. Uh, I have many friends across the country working in treatment, um, in recovery, some of them, some of them not. And uh, a good friend of mine tells a story all the time where she says that Addiction, substance use disorder, is the only diagnosable, treatable condition that we intentionally don't diagnose at onset. So when we look at a kid and we say, well, he's, he's just a kid. 
she's just a kid. Maybe she'll grow out of it. Maybe we'll have, uh, you know, uh, something will change in their life. And we don't diagnose this. We don't give them treatment. We give them some medications. We let them see a therapist maybe, and they go on their way. And then they end up like myself in their mid-20s, kicked out of college, evicted from housing, parents changing locks on doors, uh, stealing, doing what they need to do. Um, and that's not, that's not okay. And that's not going to address the crisis that we're in. Um, I did find some numbers here in Colorado. One in seven high schoolers struggling with a diagnosable, treatable condition known as substance use disorder. Um, heroin deaths in Colorado have risen 23%. Uh, since 2010, that's according to the Colorado Health Department. In 2016, there were 442 opiate-related deaths. That's both prescription medications as well as heroin. Um, 21 million Americans with a substance use disorder, uh, and only 11% of them get treatment in the course of their life. Uh, we are facing the most critical and pivotal, pivotal public health crisis that we could face, um, and we're way behind Colorado has as many treatment beds currently as the state of California has treatment centers. Uh, we just lost the Arapaho House. That's 5,000 treatment episodes a year gone. Um, politically, this is the number one bipartisan issue in the last election. I was fortunate enough to be at the Surgeon General's special report last year in Los Angeles where they unveiled the, um, the report on addiction, recovery, and treatment. Uh, and it was the first time that the Surgeon General in America has classified addiction as a diagnosable, treatable condition of the brain. Um, so these are the things I'm passionate about. Uh, adolescents in this state need care. As far as I know, outside of state-run facilities, there's only a handful that take adolescents. Uh, I've never understood this whole property values, all of that stuff. I, I was a probation officer. Uh, they used to talk about the jail, right, in Boulder County Jail, and nobody wants to live. Why? Nobody wants to live near the jail. Uh, that's not where they're hanging out if they left. Like, they want to get as far away as possible, right? I would much rather, and again, 65,000 people in 2016, that number is expected to rise in 2017. These are our neighbors, our friends. They're dying in our homes. There's people in this room right now that statistically qualify for substance abuse treatment from a statistical outlook. Um, we need options. We need options for young adults. We need options for adolescents. We need options for older adults. So uh, I would urge the committee to relook at this issue, and I would love to support that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Tom Simmons? And Martin Orner, you're going to be next. Thank you. My name is Tom Simmons, and I'm a proud resident of Longmont. I'm here also to talk about uh, COCUA recovery. The first thing that I would like to address is that I feel that uh, there is not one council member here uh, that opposes the opening of a drug and alcohol rehabilitation facility for young men aged 13 to 17. I don't think I need to tell you about the opioid epidemic and the problems that our country faces, and Longmont has its full share. Um, uh, let it be known that Longmont can be a leader, actually, in helping our young adults seek the help they need to break this chain of addiction. I, too, am a recovering addict, and I'm proud to say I have 11 years. Thank you. The pressing issue that I see at this time is that the City Council has tabled the matter of allowing Kokua to occupy and commence operations in the building of the former Bright Horizons Child Care Facility. This position has made it virtually impossible for Kokua to move forward on a building that is absolutely perfectly situated for its needs. I am also asking the council to revisit the zoning, the zoning issue and revise the city's zoning code to allow a residential child care treatment facility, COCUA, a conditional use in business light industrial zoning districts in Longmont. That's a lot to say, and I'm not sure I understand completely, but I think I'm getting to the point is that this thing has been tabled. COCUA has the opportunity to move into an absolutely perfect facility that best suits their needs I've also looked at the facility and I can't see at all how 
having an addiction treatment center where this is located would affect any residential property values at all. I'd like to get answers on that, and I, and I ask you if I could get input at a later date as how that would be a negative impact. Um, so finally, I would like to speak to the concern of some of the council members that this revision of zoning may result in Kokua being too close to a marijuana dispensary, a liquor store, or a liquor store. If this were the case, it would be virtually impossible to locate any treatment program within an area that is uh, within an area that is absolutely full of liquor stores, bars, restaurants that serve alcohol, and marijuana dispensaries. For the addict that is truly seeking help and will go to any length to achieve sobriety, the fact that there may be a bar close by will have no bearing on their survival. So finally, in closing, I would like to ask that at least one of the council members who has opposed moving forward, please change your position so that you can revisit this zoning issue. There is nothing but good that will result in allowing Kokua to occupy the Bright Horizons building. I am asking you to support a more rapid approval. I am asking you to support a more rapid approval of the ordinance that proposes to revise the city's zoning code to allow residential child care treatment as a conditional use in the light industrial zoning district. Thank you. you know, no, I was gonna, I was gonna say that uh, this is, uh, feel for, excuse me, sir, I believe Council Member Peck would like to have a discussion with you. This is a, we can treat this as a five minute public invited to be heard, but you mentioned a later date, but right. why not tonight? Council Member Peck. Am, am, am I in trouble? No, 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 no. You're going to get some feedback. Okay. Actually, what I would like, uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. What I would like is for um, uh, Councilman Rodriguez, the, since you were on planning and zoning, can you tell us the process as far? Mr. Simmons asked for how rapidly we could bring this back. Can you give us some input on um, the process? as to what we go through to and when this would come back? No, but there is a process. Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you, uh, Mayor Bagley, and uh, thank you, Councilmember Peck. <clears throat> uh, for instance, yes, uh, there's specifically usually always an agenda item before city council to allow for revisions or direction of staff to occur at the beginning of each meeting. Tonight's obviously a special circumstance due to a public forum. Um, as such, that is when we as council members can bring this back. And should we at that time bring it back, it would have to come to a vote again from city council. And if we were to say uh, allow for the zoning amendment, that would therefore make it a conditional allowed usage, right? And therefore, that would have to then come in front of our Planning and Zoning Commission. And we are talking about a time frame that will most likely take at least one month, if not longer, most likely longer. Uh, because then once Planning and Zoning has made their uh, judgment, it can be then again appealed back to City Council, which then again is a delay in time. Uh, so that's just kind of I would say the most brief synopsis of the procedure going forward uh, that this could take place in. And I'm not sure, I can't, I can't speak to how fast that procedure would occur versus the, the overhaul of our zoning codes as we move to our new zoning codes. Uh, and exactly what the discrepancy is there, I have not heard uh, a time frame on that, but it, they, I do not believe would be too far apart as far as the, the full zoning code overhaul, and if we were to revisit the ordinance uh, separately. And that's my understanding of the situation. Uh, thank you. And just real brief, uh, the reason why, so that city, city manager can set it on the agenda, the mayor could put it on the agenda, but council has already decided this issue, which means that in order for it to come back, um, like, Councilmember Finley, myself, as far as uh, uh, what is appropriate and not, Robert's rule says 
we won't be the ones, no matter how much we love or, or want something, that won't be coming from us. That would be put on the agenda by the council members that that voted no. That that they have they they hold the the reins, so to speak. Right. And so I just wanted to point that out because I'm sure at some point I'll be on the other side, and uh, I don't want to seem like, you know, I'm not putting it on the agenda. But in this particular case, um, uh, that would have to come from my my colleagues. Um, Council Member Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, is my understanding that because it's a conditional use, there has to be a public hearing or a, pub, a, a public discussion? Um, does that public discussion have to be held at any particular time in any particular sequence? Um, because one thing that might ha be able to happen is that the public hearing could be uh, could be held while the matter was pending. Is that a possibility? Uh, again, my understanding is that there is a certain prescribed amount of time uh, between the planning and zoning hearing and the public hearing. A public hearing does happen. I couldn't call it a public hearing so much as, as a neighborhood meeting or uh, held by basically the applicant. Um, and that has to happen. It has to be noticed a certain amount of time and then happen also a certain amount of time before the issue is brought before planning and zoning. That's my understanding of that procedure. But if you wanted to put it on the agenda and have a discussion on this topic, you would be able to do that even though it's not currently in the planning and zoning conditional use rezoning process. But again, that is up to uh, what? The prevailing vote, yes. yes. Council Member Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, can we, um, at this meeting, in the open forum meeting, ask for it to be put on the agenda, or do we need to wait for a regular meeting to do that? Um, I would... Uh, I, 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 I don't know the, the process. Eugene, can you answer that question? Te me? Technically... Uh, I don't think... Yeah, if, if I mean, if, if yeah. I, I will just put it on the agenda at a future time. That would just save us all. And if if if, <laughs> if the prevailing your, thank time, you out, time out, time out, no, time out, time out. What I mean is that I, I was detecting cons the consensus. If there's consensus among the prevailing vote, I will do that. If not, I'm not. I would like it to be put on a future agenda. Hopefully, the next regular session. All right, can, we've got three out of four of the prevailing members, so we'll just ask the city manager to bring this back, and we'll have a discussion. Thank you. Yeah, look at that. Look at, look, look at the public in action tonight. Hey. Oh, oh. No, 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 no. We, no, no, we can't have clapping. Yeah, no, no, no happiness allowed at government meetings. All right, Mr. Orner. Well, that was certainly refreshing. Thank you all for that. That makes all of us feel like our voices are being heard and that action can be taken. So thank you. <clears throat> Martin Orner, 1417 Auburn Court, um, here to bring up again um, aircraft noise. I am not here to... Um, talk about the, uh, the flight, the, uh, the jumping school noise. Uh, we uh, purchased our house over 10 years ago at uh, our current location. And prior to purchasing the house, uh, we made sure that we were outside of the airport influence zone. Since then, um, the airport aircraft noise over our home increases along with the passage of time. It's become common that while inside or outside of our home, we have to pause our conversations with our children or our neighbors due to aircraft noise flying directly over our head at any elevation that they choose. The aircraft noise starts around 6.50 in the morning and, especially in pleasant weather, continues without interruption all day Long. While the airport manager has spoken with me regarding the noise issue, he has stated 
that the city has not the authority to intervene. Uh, I'd like to just read from our current zoning code what this says. The residential zone. Uh, this is section 15.03.030. A, general purposes. Residential zoning districts can, contained in this section are established, designed, and intended to provide a comfortable, healthy, safe, and pleasant environment in which to live. And more specifically, I'm skipping a little bit, to ensure adequate light, air, privacy and open space for each dwelling and to protect residents from harmful effects of excessive noise, traffic congestion, and other significant adverse environmental effects. Now we go to the airport influence overlay district wording. And you'll notice that the wording protects the airport. There's nothing here to protect the residential areas. The purpose of the airport influence overlay district are to protect the ongoing ability of the airport to serve the city's transportation needs. I don't see that these individual aircraft owners flying wherever and whenever at their convenience and pleasure is considered a city transportation need. And to protect the public investment in the airport. To minimize risks to public safety and minimize hazards to airport users. To protect property values and restrict incompatible land uses, which I interpret, doesn't say anything otherwise, to protect the airport. To promote appropriate land use planning and zoning in the area influenced by the airport. We are influenced by the airport. The application of the special AIZ regulation, it says conflicting provisions. If the AIZ regulation stated in this section conflict with the provisions of any other chapter or section of the development code, or with any other applicable land development regulation, the AIZ, the AIZ regulations in this section shall apply. Everything else is off the table. It says it right in our code that we protect the airport over everything else. There is no reference in the wording that I have found that references the AIZ map, how increased aircraft traffic is changing what should be a change to the airport influence district map. Over time, with more traffic and operations, that's got to increase, it's got to expand. This is just logical stuff. It happens at every airport. In closing, I would certainly uh, appreciate and I request that city council schedule a special meeting regarding the airport and aircraft operations I'm not talking about the jump guys. From what I've observed, they are following the contours and staying within the airport influence zone area. It's all these other individual guys who are having a good time when it's nice weather flying directly over our houses at any elevation and at any time. I thank you for listening, and I look forward to hearing about this again. Hold on one sec. I think somebody has a question for you, or at least a comment. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, just uh, since we have already um, started charging a fee for the drop zone of 338,000 feet for uh, the airline or for the for the jumpers, I'm wondering. I heard from a couple of people that they were. I don't know how to say this, but um, the. Airport jumpers are only using the King Air airplane. Have you noticed anything about that? They weren't using the other uh, otters. I've noticed. I've noticed. I've I've noticed both aircraft. But as I have stated in it my presentation, just that one. it's the individual operators. I don't okay. see in my in my experience. While I see the guys jumping and I hear the otter and the other ones around, it's the individual single engine guys, especially, who are flying wherever and whenever and at any elevation that they choose. All right, thank you very much for thank coming. Thank you, thank you. Jan DeBain.
Jan de Bana from. Uh, uh, I, I knew I was going to slaughter <laughs> that one. That's okay. De Bana. I'm used to that. I'm from uh, 1422 Burlington Drive in Longmont. And also, um, I want to express my support for the Cocoa Volunteer Teenage Treatment Center in the proposed uh, business light industrial zoning area. And I think it is interesting that um, we allow liquor stores and plot, dispenser, uh, pot dispensaries adjacent to residential areas, but uh, we would want to postpone a voluntary treatment center for youth due to a minor point in, in the zoning code. And again, I'm in support of, of changing that and doing that sooner rather than later. Uh, part of it is that, that tabling these zoning discussions would be uh, in effect uh, and the possibility of the Cocoa Center being allowed to open and uh, coming into business. So I'm, again, just expressing my, my support for, for this uh, treatment center for this youth. Thank you. Thanks. Susan Gill? Council members and uh, mayor, thanks so much for giving us the time. Um, I speak tonight. I speak for the youth who often have little voice in what we're doing and why we're doing it. For five years, I was the director of activities for a nonprofit's uh, events for young women, ages 12 to 18, in cooperation with some young men also. So over five years, I spent thousands and thousands of hours listening to hundreds and hundreds of youth talk about their lives. I'm here to tell you that the childhood that we experienced doesn't exist in this country anymore. There are so many pressures on the youth, most of which have come up about because of the uh, social media platforms that form so much of their social interactions. And some of the substances that are available now so easily when they were a little more difficult when I was a child. <clears throat> Many of you will remember that it was not long ago that 700, about 700 youth from high schools in this area were found uh, involved in a porn ring and some of those suffered from porn addiction. That was, what, a year and a half ago, maybe two? I have spent hours listening to the youth and their struggles. I've listened to students who have had to change schools to get away from friends that they feel are pressuring them. I've listened to st students who were suicidal because they could see no other way out. They would rather look for a long-term solution to a short-term problem because they see no other way. During that time, I studied the development of the teenage brain the teenage brain is, a, is a, in the process of pruning down to only the most necessary pathways. So all the pathways, neural networks that were created in childhood are being pruned down to the most important pathways that will be used for decades. And because of this, any addiction that is formed during the teen years is infinitely harder to break than an addiction that is formed during adult years. I urge you not to delay. Thank you, Ms. Peck, for putting it back on the agenda. If you look at what Mr. Huey has done in the Midwest, I would believe he runs a tight ship. He's talked to me about some of the service activities that he wants these youth to do. He's talked to me about the importance of letting youth form new friendships with new people that also have their same desire to break away and build a newer, better, safer life for themselves. We cannot afford, we cannot afford to be a community of ostriches because the teenagers that are in school today will be, will be our doctors tomorrow, will be the prison inmates of tomorrow. We really cannot afford to delay. I would urge you to do whatever you have to do for zoning to make sure that the Kokua facility can get started as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Gill. Mike Schnetzmeyer. Hello, sorry. 
I'm Mike Schnatzmeyer, 12001 Twilight Street, Longmont. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and the council and new council members. Um, for five years before the epic 2013 flood event, I tried forewarning of this clear and imminent $300 million threat to the city and its residents. The flood threat continues to exist until we fully complete flood mitigation work underway. But I'm here to speak about another even larger and even more imminent threat to the city, our long-term fiscal health, which is at risk from what is nationally coming to be known as the infrastructure crisis. In the spring of 2016, author and speaker Joe Minicozzi presented at the Longmont Museum. I urge every council member and city leader to watch the YouTube videotaping of that event. In short, his message was this, low density car oriented sprawl creates enormous unmet long-term fiscal liabilities for infrastructure replacement. In contrast, denser smart growth development of walkable mixed use neighborhoods promotes jobs and business creation and revenues that that brings. Boulder gets this as any good to great city would know. For years, their policies have been to maximize revenues, i.e. business and job creation, creating over 47,000 net incoming jobs to the city every day. At the same time, they're, they're effectively exporting and minimizing the liability of housing-related infrastructure costs to surrounding cities like Longmont. Local affordable housing is needed. But in addressing this problem, we need to be smart. Suburban sprawl comprised of mono-use, single-family residential car-oriented housing projects driven purely by for-profit developers is creating a huge, enormous long-term liability for Longmont and is worsening traffic, pollution, and other problems. Developing higher-density, mixed-use, walkable, and bikeable neighborhoods designed for people and placemaking is a far better solution. That is, we need smart growth, not dumb growth, to survive in both a digital information age economic revolution and in the era of climate change. Car-oriented developments fail seniors. They fail the young, the poor, and marginalized residents that don't drive. If you want affordable housing, build a walkable, bikeable, denser, mixed-use, smart growth city. Living without a car can free up to $9,000 per year in household budgets that can be used towards housing, health care, education, food, and other beneficial uses. If you want senior housing, build a walkable city. Seniors should be able to leave their, their compounds and complexes and to engage, walk out of those, and walk out and engage with the, and contribute to the larger community. If you want social equity, build a walkable city. For Andreas Duani, the designer of Prospect, it should be a basic human right to be able to live without having to own a car to merely survive and get your basic human needs met. If you want an attractive city to millennials to create jobs and start a business as they bring, build a walkable and bikeable, smart growth, mixed use city. Car-free living and spontaneous interactions of urban life reflect what the millennials seek today. If you want to have a healthy city with less traffic, build a walkable city. Car-oriented developments created more traffic and infrastructure costs long-term. Walkable and bikeable cities are healthier and have reduced traffic. If you want to bring fast tracks to town, build a walkable and bikeable city. It helps create the densities and critical mass of users needed to empower fast tracks and the business model to bring it to town. If you want to address global climate change, build a walkable and bikeable city. Carbon footprint of urban areas is typically about half that of urban sprawl when you consider transportation and building, building energy efficiency uses. If you want to reduce tax burdens on our cities, and create a long-term, economically sustainable city, build a walkable, bikeable, denser, smart growth city. 
We need to stop empowering urban sprawl that creates long-term liabilities for the city and contributes to global climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schmoshmeyer. Mr. Ken and Bev Huey. And then just so to keep in mind, you will have between 10 and 15 minutes at some point on an agenda here in the near future. So I'm not your lawyer, but I'd say be really careful what you say. Yeah. Well done. And, and, you know, speed it up too, right? I mean, seriously. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying. Just, well, I'm okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay. great. Let me say first, um, thank you. Before things went the way they did, I had already been watching each of you. And watching the way that you are giving such attention and respect, I know that there must be issues that you care less than others about or more, and, but the attention and respect that you're giving everybody that stands at this podium is really, really moving. So thank you very much. It feels tremendous. Um, I, I want to speak to the council and just be on record so that this is short because really we've kind of made some decisions and we're moving in a direction, so that's terrific. Uh, but as part of that, I want to thank supporters who have shown up today, some that I just met today. I had people contact me. I only reached out in t two venues to say, hey, you know, if you want to say something, say something. And it, uh, others came to me and asked how they could help, and it turned into a groundswell that, is tr that you're seeing today. So it, some are already have left, four or five have already left. But those that are here in support of Kokua and this zoning change, the potential, would you please just stand? I really want to say thanks to these folks. It's an amazing, amazing thing. I'm, I'm moved beyond words. Um, the neighborhood meeting that uh, Councilman Rodriguez spoke about uh, was publicized. Uh, I personally got every single address of even renters within 1,000 feet, which is what's required of the building. I, I stamped every darn envelope, put everybody's name, got them to the city. They were mailed out. It was. I also put signs in front of the building. Uh, nobody came to that meeting. It was canceled, and I don't know if there was notification. So, you know, uh, I was told by Mr. Schumacher that there are ways to streamline it, and I would just urge, please, might we streamline it? Here's, there's a couple of issues. We're into this eight months. You're only seeing a part of it. I, I can start over. We'll, we'll get this done. And if I have to go somewhere else, I'll go somewhere else and I'll get it done. But I'll be at least eight months down the road from right now. Let me tell you what eight months looks like, and I'm not kidding about this. One of the first girls that I ever worked with had an addiction and an eating disorder that went with it. And she arrived at a facility, was my first job out of graduate school as a PhD. And she came with an IV drip and having to walk around in the halls of this facility, a residential treatment facility, and that was what was keeping her alive, and the doctor was very clear. She had gotten into us, gotten treatment, with about a week to spare where she would have been dead otherwise. It really is that important, right? So we worked with her. It was a very difficult process. Uh, she had a, a real hard time. It's been 15 years now, but she made amazing gains. The end of the day, she left. Uh, the, the, the amazing news is that seven years ago, she came and visited my program in Missouri to tell the kids how it was possible to survive and change. She is an attorney. She was graduated from law school and worked over in China for five years and just got home with her husband and is a functioning, contributing member of society because of the work that my team did. Not me, my team. I'm forever grateful for that. But that week, I'm not trying to just be dramatic. Seriously, if we take an extra five months or four months or three months, we can't disobey any kind of law, but to the extent that we can speed up the process to a yes or a no. If it's a no, I need to know that quickly because every single week we lose kids. Truly, they die. This kills people. And so the groundwork that we've done already, I just don't want to redo it or start the clock again and thereby actually lose the life of a child. Thank you very much for listening to me. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Dr. Huey. Bev Huey.
I'm Beverly Huey, 1405 Clover Creek Drive. And um, first I want to thank you. I think that we've already accomplished what we really wanted to happen tonight, and that was just to get back on the agenda because I think everything, every single one of you wants the same thing that we want, and it's just a matter of how we do it. And I appreciate that so much. I'll still share some of my thoughts with you, though. Um, like I said, we're not here to talk about the good of what Koku could do necessarily. We'll get, it sounds like we'll get that chance now because we're on the agenda, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I know that you already see the benefits and the need of having such a facility. I actually have confidence that this council would approve Kokua eventually. And unfortunately, as spoken about tonight, we don't have a lot of time to postpone this decision. Um, I understand why the city council would want more time to make sure that everything is covered, but um, the facility that seems so perfect for this um, we're running out of time on our opportunity to enter that building, and so that's why we're trying to really streamline the process and to get this, um, this underway. I just also wanted to let you know how much thought has gone into deciding our, for our family personally to move to Longmont. We didn't just take a map and throw a dart at it and decide to come here. It was very thought out, and I have three children, one whom we uprooted as a senior in high school to come to this area for a lot of different reasons. We want to be here, we like Longmont, we see a need to be here, and um, we really want to make this happen. We've handpicked this area. Um, we were able to establish a residential treatment center for troubled youth in Missouri where we moved from and we learned a lot in the process. It was a very successful place that helped a lot of children. And again, we'll, we're on the agenda, so we'll get to tell you about all the benefits, not only for the kids that we're helping, but for the community, the jobs that are um, created, the community atmosphere of coming together, and the very name that we chose for Kokua, um, Academy, Kokua Treatment Center, is a Hawaiian word that means a community coming together to help an individual, and that is what we are all about. Again, I just want to thank you that we will get to have our day to um, talk about it and to try to get this approved. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Huey. Uh, I'm going to take a risk here. Denise Verongin, am I even close? That close? <laughs> All right, Denise, how do you pronounce that last name? Frungian. Frungian. Yeah, yeah, you got it pretty close. Well, it's nice to meet you all, new council, new mayor, thank you. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of... Just pull the mic close to your lips. Okay. Get it right Hello. up there so they can hear you at home and all that good stuff. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm here to speak about um, our cruelty to animals ordinance that it's lacking um, or needs to be updated. It's out of date, and I would like to see it be to be including tethering restrictions and um, I wrote some notes. Um, dogs should never be tethered 24-7, and I figured an average lifespan of um, 10 years probably for an outside dog um, averages out to being like 88,000 hours staked to an object. Um, so tethering restrictions I feel need to include no tethering of a dog under six months, because we've witnessed eight-week-olds tethered. So to include no tethering of a dog under six months and also in their senior years, and to be brought indoors during extreme weather conditions. Um, the late-night barking is also annoying to neighbors. Um, and I'd like to see restrictions of no tethering between, well, not just me, but peop other people I've spoken with, but restrictions of no tethering between 10 p.m. 
and 7 a.m., which is Longmont's curfew anyway. And then for daytime, no tethering for more than four hours at a given time. And this can all be enforced by public awareness. And I have a, I could say a whole lot more, but I'm not going to. <laughs> it would be very boring. But anyway, thank you all for listening and for your time. Can I, I hope we can make this happen. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. I, I, I empathize with you. Why would you ever tether a dog for just four hours? At a given time. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is why would an owner, I mean, I've got two dogs I just love to death. One's Pitbull, one's a little Frenchie. I know, just, we're in a dog community. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my yeah. question is what, what, what do you think a person would, what, if, why would they want to tether a dog for even four hours? What I'm saying is Well, that, for some people, they need to tether their dog for maybe they don't have fencing. Got it. So in other words, I don't know, you know, some people are, are bound and determined to tether their dog and I witness it. I witness four that have to live like that. And the people just seem that's their choice of how to confine their animals. Um, Cause I'd never so that's why dogs. I'm throwing in four hours at a given time for those people who feel it necessary to tether their dog. Okay. And even four hours, I think is too much. Yeah. I'd agree with you. That was the point of my question. Yeah. I so. would rather see no tethering, you know, and there's a place in Oregon, it's called Fences for Fido for people who don't have fencing and don't, cannot afford fencing. So as a community, they've gotten together to provide um, the labor and the material to help people help their dogs. It's really for their dogs. Um, so I would really like to see this happen in 2018. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Christensen. Uh, do you know if there's a link? Oh, sorry. Is there a length of the tether to? I live next door to some very bad people, and they had two dogs tethered. Each one had a tether of about a foot and a half. Has to be six feet minimum. Yeah, six well, feet minimum. Okay, so we do have something like that in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we do. That's and it'd good be to best know. to put them if you have to tether them, put them on a trolley or a pulley. Yeah. You know, give them some exercise, some freedom. Yeah. And, thank you for you know, bringing this to our attention. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Denise. You bet. And okay. I forgot how to pronounce your last name. I always said. Frungian. It's Frungian. <laughs> right. Liz Gobel or Gobel? I think it's Gobel. Bile. Liz. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Mayor B um, Bagley and the council members. Uh, I'm in here to support the updating our cruelty to animal law to include tethering restrictions. Um, there is a lot more that Denise could say, uh, could have said. One of them is also to our benefit. When you have these dogs, and maybe, Polly, you know of this, if they're out there 24 seven and they're never got taken off the, the leash, they urinate and defecate in one spot. That odor comes to your neighbors, that gets into soil, the urine, and any bacteria because you can pick up bacteria from soil. Um, that's one thing that Denise didn't mention but I think she had it written down. Also, by doing that tethering at night, you are subjecting the dogs to very dangerous conditions in that they can be attacked by other animals, such as raccoons, skunks, foxes, and many of them are rabies carriers and distemper carriers. Um, these dogs basically are just sitting ducks. So. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Mike Fixico. Thank you. I'm here to support on the tethering. I have a lot of other stuff, but I'll leave that. That takes too long. Um, on the tethering, it's very stressful to the animal. Growing up, 
in other states that I have lived at, I've had one break his tether and had to end up shooting it because it was coming after me, attacked. So to me, tethering psychologically harms the dog, makes them fearful, and they go after whatever is in front of them, and it's not going to stop them. I was, I grew up where you let your dogs run free, country. Here you can't, I understand that. But you can have your fences and let them run back there. You don't have to tether them. Tethering is probably the most cruelest punishment there is for an animal. As Native Americans, animals are related to us. They're a part of our life. They're our friends. They help us. And by doing that, we're degrading them, disrespecting them, their freedom as well. We should have something in line that would make it unlawful to keep them tethered more than four hours a day. But like I said, some people at work that don't have a, can't afford a daycare for the dog or boarding, they tether them. But some, it should be laws saying that there is a certain amount of time. Some will be eight, some could be four, who knows? But either way, it'd be like you guys having to be chained to your desk 24 seven. You can't go home, can't go to the bathroom, you know, can't get to the water faucet or coffee pot, you know. So that's the way I see things. I look at things differently than a lot of people do. It's hard to visualize what it would be like to be like that. Growing up, I've been in jail for a lot of things, drinking, raising hell as a kid. But I learned to appreciate my freedom once I was free. And animals should have that same freedom, even though we are in a city where it's, man has kind of taken over and you've got people that love their dogs. Then you got those that just want the dogs to be there and they say they got it there for protection, but you got on a log chain that weighs 20, 30 pounds, dragging it around, hurting them. I mean, not getting them in from the cold like last night and the day before or in the hot summers when it's, even with the ceremonies I do, it gets pretty tough. And they're not having water once, once a day and fed once a day. So I've seen dogs that's been out chained in these kind of conditions for the last 18 years since I've been here, different places. And no matter what we do, the animal controls, Hands are tied because there's no set law about the tethering. All it is is that if they can have cover, food, water, and shade, that's it. So, but I've never seen some of these dogs taken in. If they are, they just got a probably about a quarter inch plywood box covering them. And they're in their own feces, their own urine, and the people come out instead of remove it, they just take the hose and water it down and get it into the soil. And you can smell it from depending on which direction the wind's blowing. So hopefully this is something that a lot of people might have concern and might think about wanting to do too. In joint, in invest in this kind of law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fixico. Uh, Eugene, would it be possible just to get a, could you uh, just send out the or applicable city uh, ordinance that pertains to cruelty to animals and or tethering and, and maybe we could start there and just city council could review it and then kind of go from there? Thanks. See, yet again. Making some progress. All right. <laughs> Jeffrey Justice.
Jeffrey Justice, 1503 Lamplighter Drive in Longmont. Uh, last Tuesday, I came and spoke about the horrific dog attack and dog death on December 5th at the 1600 block of Metropolitan in Ward 1. Won't go into that, but um, since I spoke, um, I really want to thank the city manager for speaking to me at the break during the meeting and take his interest in that. Um, and my questions about ordinances and such, um, Council Member Rodriguez called me back since he's the, uh, what do you call it, the roving rep or whatever, because our Ward 1, we lost him to the mayor. Um, so, sorry, sorry right. at this point. <laughs> but uh, he, he answered my question in, in absolute total detail to the point where he would be the authority on this particular issue that I'm bringing up. And it, it appears that the ordinance for a loose dog that attacks a leash dog, someone who's just walking their dog on public streets, minding their own business, being attacked by a dog and killed, that the ordinance doesn't treat that any, doesn't even treat it as seriously as a dog that bites a person. And that there is, the quarantine isn't like it would be if the dog bit a person. I think an attack like that is horrific, um, especially a loose dog attacking a person walking their dog legally on the street minding their own business. That's a horrific attack, and I don't know how to change ordinances. I mean, I, you know, I've, uh, I got all the animal ordinances. I saw what they say. City manager talked to me, council member Rodriguez, Talk to me about it. It does. I would like to see the ordinance modified reasonably. That if there's a horrific dog attack on another dog, resulting in very serious injury or death, that that dog faces a quarantine, um, whether it be at Longmont Humane, a approved facility, or at home, but something to keep the public safe until that case is cleared in court. Uh, the court case for that is February 22nd. I'll make sure to go to see how this turns out. And that, it may end up uh, being a fair uh, verdict there. But in the meantime, that dog doesn't face the quarantine that uh, a dog that like bit a person would face. So I don't know if that, to me that, uh, doesn't keep the public safe. That dog should be monitored, quarantined, and it's not from all the research I've done. So I just leave it to you. I don't, I don't know what else to do. Uh, you do. Would you have put that dog down? Personally, no. Okay. Personally, no, and I don't, would never support any breed-specific legislation or size restriction. That's why I say reasonable. It's just something to tighten it up. I'm you just know? I was just talking about specifically... If no. a dog, regardless? Uh, well, it would, you know, it would depend. Uh, my opinion, first of all, no, as a, as a dog lover, it would have to be, a judge would have to decide that based on a behavior analysis. But personally, no. That's not what I'm going for in any of these talks I give. It's just, let's just do something reasonable to keep that dog secured under quarantine and being evaluated. Maybe the, the living conditions in that house aren't so good. It lives with another dog that it fights with. The other things I can't control, but maybe you can. So okay. I just want to see something reasonable done. I was hoping you would say something like that. So good, right. good job. Good job. Yeah. Okay, well, all right. Uh, Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, hello, Mr. Justice. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, I've had some further uh, conversations after our previous conversation, and I feel that uh, it was conveyed to me that there's kind of a miscommunication as far as verbiage is concerned, as far as the quarantine is concerned. Uh, with uh, animal to human interaction, the quarantine is spe specifically about rabies. And so they will do a quarantine to, to uh, monitor the, the animal for rabies, whereas they do still in an animal-on-animal -animal attack specifically, constrain the dog to its property, its specific property, with a bunch of regulations uh, that are connected to the, the citation, to the, uh, the ticket, uh, which are not taken off until after the case is resolved. 
that is that is through uh, further communication. What I would say is some sort of uh, irregularity, maybe in verbiage, where the the animal is constrained to its property in concept of quarantine, whereas the the true statement and usage of the word quarantine is specific to rabies. Uh, but I do feel that there may be some things that we can do to to help uh, increase safety as far as animal on animal attacks are concerned. But just to give you an update on further conversations I've had since we, we spoke on the phone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mayor Pro Tem Christensen. Uh, thank you, Councilman Thank you, Councilman Rodriguez, for uh, clarifying that. Uh, I, I I think that you know this is a, a terrible incident because I know that woman loved her dog very much, and I know the the guy who has the the big dog um, also he and his family love that that dog too. And I'm I'm glad to hear that you wouldn't just automatically <coughs> have that dog uh, killed. I think that we could probably it would be a good idea for us maybe while we're looking at one dog uh, problem to look at some others, which is specifically that um, if you restrict that dog uh, to being monitored somehow and not leaving its property, it might be possible to see that there are some problems in that home or there are some problems, maybe the animal has some health problems. But in any case, a, a dog who does that is um, needs retraining first of all, and that should be maybe um, mandatory retraining of a dog. Uh, and I, I'm not sure how we would do that, but certainly we've seen all these TV shows and dogs can learn things, maybe not my dog, but other, you know, <laughs> smarter dogs can learn things. And um, certainly the, the most basic thing that a dog needs to learn is not to attack, uh, even though that's a natural instinct for them but uh having been attacked by by a uh tiny little dog when i was just walking down the street um and having my father who also loved animals uh being attacked by a german shepherd when he was just walking down the street uh, i can tell you this happens to this happens all the time as dogs get out they roam around they get confused they don't know what they're doing but we can't let them be roaming around. So first of all, that dog needs to be confined so it won't hurt anybody else again. And then it needs to be evaluated. We can't just leave that up to the owner because it likely won't happen. So could we also discuss uh, some of these Did kind of confinement things and our, the way we treat these incidents of dog uh, dogs attacking dogs? Eugene, could you include that particular ordinance as well? We got a yes. Okay. So Thank like you for right. yeah, bringing this up to us again. I appreciate the cooperation and uh, all the feedback that I've been given. Thanks we'll be lot. doing some dog talking. All right. Uh, it's uh, We've been going for an hour and a half. So, uh, uh, Georgetta Johnstown, we're going to go ahead and break for five minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll pick up with you. Is that okay? All right, great.
Oh, but they pronounced they, it was written Johnstown. Uh, oh, that's somebody wrote point. it wrong. All right. Johnston. All right. <laughs> anyway, good evening, Mayor and Councilman. Most of you as I know. Georgetta Johnston at 320 Homestead Parkway, Longmont, Colorado. So I want to say that the people are trying to get this thing going to help people. That's wonderful. Lord bless them. Lord bless them. Lord bless them. So uh, people came to the council complaining about the sweet things, that the sweets that were going on that was endangering other people that lived there, serious drugs. I was going to come a long time ago because the paper's been going on those things like that, but I haven't been able to. I know that some people that lived there were saying it was not safe there because people were doing the meth drugs and other drugs in the apartments. So the LHA had to get extra people to protect the building because of what was going on. Because certain people acted like they don't have to go by house, Longwood Housing ma Management Rules. The police department is there to protect us. Now, I'm concerned that when the director of operations, Crystal, went in on site with the supervisor and police to check out the apartments, that people acted like they had something to hide and carried on. I know that this has been going on and they've made some settlements and stuff, but I live in an apartment and if they need to come into mine, I've got nothing to hide. So it doesn't bother me. But I know people there personally that we're afraid of the drugs. And I also hear now that there are some apartments there that you are used with meth, and now it's going to cost them thousands of dollars to straighten those apartments out at the suites. Crystal is a caring, kind, listening person that never got unkind working with people that needed affordable housing. My husband worked with many city boards and always spoke highly of her. And I got to know her through helping people and us. I live in the affordable housing, and my lease says management has the right to come into the apartment at any time if they suspect something that's wrong. I do have a problem for them. I do not have a problem for them coming in and checking mine. Rules. Now, what I'm, what I'm really, I'm really up troubled over this. It's hit the paper, 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 and uh, I know that I can't do anything about it. But you know what? You as the ones over us. We want a good city to live in. We want protection. I've never drugged, and I don't drink, never in my life. Of course, I'm not fond of these breweries and marijuana situations, very dangerous and killers. But you know what? We need good leaders that are over our city that care about people. And in like these apartments and like this one here, I know that people are there that maybe have some really severe handicaps. Where I live, they also do too. But one night at 5 in the morning, they had some people come to where we are that were on drugs and tried to get in. And sometimes they can sneak in there, but sometimes people live in there, live in the apartments and try to get by with stuff like that. Now this to me is very upsetting over her. I, she came and was over our building. Some others from our building had to go over to the suites and babysit because of so much danger there. You know, I don't know. This is just not, it's just real troubling to me that innocent people, innocent people were, uh, and the police. My husband has worked with the police for years and years and years. He was a chaplain. And, uh, you know what, I don't try to break laws myself. They stop me and I'm doing something wrong, you know what, then uh, it's okay, but I, don't, I try my best to go by rules. So this is really, really troubling to me. It's hit the paper over and over and over, and I think it's just so troubling myself, so troubling. I want you all to think about it because, you know, it is. And, and the housing and the people on the board, her and, and different ones, I've known for years and years, and my husband has worked with them. And, and you know what? We're people that should stand behind people, caring about people. And this is really, I, I'm a person that uh, 
you know, what I want is what's right and honest and a good city and, and protection and people working with people. And I'm listening to about different subjects tonight, which is good, you know, because that's what we're about. Lord bless you, precious people. Thank you, Ms. For Jones. listening to me. Thank you for listening to me, and I hope that you're thinking about it. Thank you. You're welcome. Judith nice Blackburn. You again. I see I saw you snuck in the back. Come on up. Good evening, Council. Uh, this forum idea is kind of a new one to me, and I didn't know how much would be questions and answers um, or how much would just be <laughs> you listening <laughs> yet again. Um, Judith Blackburn, 3724 Oakwood Drive. I want to give a, a shout out to uh, a city agency that is doing a superb job, and that is our senior center here in Longmont. I am so proud of being associated with that place, and I think you should be too. Our senior center is by far the most active, the most comprehensive, the most efficiently run senior center of any uh, up and down the Front Range. I don't know if you're aware of what a good value you're getting for dollars spent because that uh, staff is so efficient and such hard workers. Every four times a year they put out a huge document like this full of their programs and services. And it's everything from field trips to Spanish lessons to history programs to dancing like we had at the uh, Martin Luther King uh, s celebrations on Monday. And Mayor Bagley, I thought your proclamation was excellent and nicely delivered uh, Monday. That was a pleasure. But this senior center um, staff, I remember going to Rhythm on the River a couple of years ago, and almost all the volunteers there were employees of the senior center, kind of keeping that uh, wonderful event afloat with their extra time after the long hours they put in. So if we get an opportunity to recognize with an award or proclamation sometime in the future, I hope we'll single out the Senior Center. It's, uh, I mean, they take people 55 and over, so that's probably about half the people that live in Longmont, <laughs> and I think it's great. Um, <clears throat> another thing I wanted to talk about in my five minutes is um, it's more of a question. I'm unsure where the mapping of flow lines, gathering lines, pipelines to do with gas under our city is. In other words, I know we had a study. I mean, the, ma the uh, governor of Colorado asked the COGCC to do it for the whole state, and I know that hasn't happened. And I went down last Monday to their hearings to kind of complain about that and ask uh, what was happening, and also to say that I'm, I'm frightened. I feel like uh, other explosions, such as happened in Firestone, could happen here easily or, or elsewhere. I understand that such inspections as they've done, they've already found 400 um, so-called closed pipelines or flow lines, gathering lines, I don't even know the difference from uh, among all those. But 400 is a small percentage of how many they tested, but it's a lot, it's a large number if each one of those is a potential explosion uh, or could be. And so um, I need a little clarification. Maybe it's just work I need to do and I haven't found where to look it up on how we stand with that here in Longmont. So that was one of my requests. Also, COGCC is accepting um, written comments through the 19th, which is Friday. And I hope people listening to this will uh, send in something, because there were, I thought, quite not very many people there in Denver on Monday to testify. <clears throat> and they did invite 
uh, elected ef officials to come, and I looked at the agenda. I didn't stay for the whole day, and I didn't see Longmont on there. So I I hope that we are going to make our our contribution to the the urgency of that mapping thing, which is still only the first step in in monitoring and remediating anything that's wrong. So thank you for the opportunity here. So all you need to do is shoot me an email. We can do a proclamation. Good. So let's do that. Second, um, uh, Dale, what is the current status on the mapping of the flow lines and the gathering lines? Because I'm, I mean, you're the guy that knows. Ah, thank you. Um, Mayor uh, Bagley and members of council, the um, <clears throat> the city right now in the urbanized area of the city in, in Boulder County, there's there's one gathering line. Um, it's on the eastern side of the city. It comes across the Ryder property, um, and then it goes to the uh, sort of the alignment of the uh, power transmission line that's running north south out on the east side of the city, um, and then eventually it makes its way back um, over back into Weld County and then heads east. Um, out on city open space property out in Weld County, there's any number of flow lines associated with the active wells that are still out there. There's about 10 or 13 active wells. So we are familiar with the gathering lines that are certainly within the urbanized area of the city, and we do have those mapped in public works and natural resources, and um, be happy to share that with you. Um, so I think we're actually in pretty good shape there, knowing where so, those are. And then, so is there a chance that gathering line would be closed? Uh, correct, uh, Mayor Bagley. We are, um, it, it, it is our interest as a city to had that gathering line abandoned, uh, properly abandoned as soon as we can in the future. It's, it's, it's currently serving a single well um, um, out on um, uh, near Union Reservoir that if that well were to be plugged and abandoned, which we do, oh, sorry, sorry I'm, not, I'm not doing it right. Um, so if we can get that well plugged and abandoned, then we would be able to decommission that uh, gathering line. Thank you. Council Member Peck? Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, Dale, are those maps available on the website, or is it something you have to send to to Judith per an email? If we have to send it to Judith, we will, but I do believe we ought to be able to get those up onto our website. If they're not already there, I just don't know off the top of my head if it's out there. I don't either, yeah. But I'll check. And then you can tell us what the URL is that for that so we can publish it Correct. so people can go look. Okay, thank you. And uh, the, lastly, um, is there any are, do we have any plans to map the ones that are out there east on open space? Um, we have many of the gathering lines mapped out there. Um, the flow lines, we're familiar with generally where they are, uh, certainly on the active wells, which is what the condition is out there on the open space properties, um, because those generally are between the wellhead and the separator and the tanks, which is a sort of a confined area. Um, I do believe there's probably more work that could be done out there, though, and I do believe it would be um, wise for those to get mapped, and I think it is wise for the uh, state to require it. And to answer the question, the city is actively involved in that rulemaking um, process and submitting our comments in collaboration with Boulder County and some of the other cities in, in Boulder County. If we were to, I, I mean, I th my understanding was that consensus was we wanted those mapped, right? So I mean that. that so let's just, I guess I mean we could put it on agenda and talk about it. But I, I think we understand that, and right. you know the process of this of the city mapping a private infrastructure is um, not as straightforward as it is, for instance, with a public infrastructure. And so we have to be able to work with the operators in order to get that information. All right. So I, I still think legislation would be good. Great, thank you. All right, Stan Chowers. Thank you, Mayor, Councilman. Um, thank you for your service, uh, using your time and your talents to represent us who maybe don't have so much time and definitely don't have the talent. Uh, thank you for being so considered about the zoning laws. Uh, I remember many years ago, my parents, um, 
I guess they would say they were stabbed in the back by their uh, city council with respect to some some zoning laws that were changed and it adversely affected the, their property values. And since then, I've, I've always felt that um, that's one of the more, more sacred duties of the city council. So I just want to say that I appreciate your careful deliberation um, on uh, considering the Kokua Treatment Center. Um, I'd, I'd like to make a, a just a couple comments to maybe uh, ease your minds in um, reevaluating and hopefully expediting um, rezoning for to support that facility. Uh, I live at Stan Showers, <laughs> twenty five twenty Lanyon Drive. Um, I'm two blocks from a fire department, and I'm four blocks from a hospital. And I like that. There's a house down the road from us, less than a block away, that nearly burned down. Um, it's a good feeling having that there. I think that um, we shouldn't be afraid to have a mental health facility nearby. Um, maybe we don't really think of equate a mental health facility to a hospital, but if you think about it, they serve about the same purpose. My daughter, um, she's a, an assistant supervisor at a, at a, a facility, and she was very, very, um, she has witnessed um, the success that, that happens in those facilities, and as a, and as a, um, a student, she's learned, you know, the statistics of what happens when when you have intervention as a youth as opposed to not getting that. And the communities are better, right? Because the people that don't get the attention that they need end up with bigger problems later in life. And so um, I see this as a positive and I see it as worth um, the risk of of expediting uh, the process so that so that this can be a so that this thing can happen um, for the good of the community and of course for those those people that so are so desperately need this help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Showers. Christine Showers. Good evening, council members and mayor. Thank you for being here tonight and listening to all of us. My name is Christine Showers, and I have lived in Longmont for almost 15 years. I love this city. It's a great city. We moved here from a bigger city. We moved here from San Jose, and coming here to a smaller city was, was welcoming for me. I, I love raising my children here. Um, and I really am grateful that you have thought about putting this residential treatment center back on the agenda because, um, as my husband said, we have a daughter who works at a residential facility in another state. It's uh, not for Mr. Huey, um, but her and I talk on the phone a lot. Um, and we talk about um, these teens that she works with and what they suffer from. She works with a wide range of, of um, problems with them. They, they suffer from different disorders such as uh, drug addiction, depression, um, eating disorders, PTSD, um, suicidal ideation, anxiety, and even social media addiction. And these teens go through intense searches and checks before they enter the facility. And um, they're not allowed to leave the site. And they have staff there helping them and watching them. And she was telling me about the therapy that they get. They get so many hours of therapy. And um, these are teens whose parents are searching for help. And 
they need help for their children. As you've heard earlier, um, teenagers are very impressionable. I have two currently at home now, and um, I, as a parent, would be grateful if anything were to ever happen where I needed a facility to take them to, that there would be access to that. Um, and so we do know, and, and my daughter has told me this, that if a teen gets help early on, they are able to transition into adulthood better. And the program is designed to save families and their teenagers, and it saves lives. Um, these teenagers will learn to develop healthy relationships in the future and become responsible citizens. And isn't that what we want here in Longmont especially? And I believe that um, you have made the right decision to put this back on the table. I don't know that I will be here for the bigger meeting, but I just wanted to go on the record as saying that I think this is a smart move for Longmont, and um, I think that for parents, it would be um, a comfort to them. And I thank you for listening to me tonight. Thank you very much. Gordon Pedro. Mayor, City Council, thank you for providing this opportunity for us to speak for five minutes instead of three, even though I don't plan to take the full five minutes. This first statement I will make will not be a surprise to you. Traffic congestion has become a real community issue. County Line Road, Highway 119, Hover Road, Nelson Road, are just a few of the streets that flunk any reasonable standard in the eyes of drivers for several hours of each weekday. I believe it is time that the City Council adopt a reasonable, measurable transportation standard that will be applied to every development application going forward. I would like to point out a real example of a budding traffic problem coming your way. While reading minutes of a recent P&Z meeting, it came to my attention that an application for annexation is under review for approximately 100 acres west of Hover, south of Rogers Road, and north of Nelson. I'm sure you'll recognize that two of those three streets were named in the beginning of my statement about being congested for several hours each day, weekday. In the PNZ minutes of the HMS annexation application, I came across an appalling statement that seems to explain why increasing traffic congestion has become a nightmare. The appalling statement came from the consultant presenting the application for HMS. And I don't have the exact quote, so this is paraphrasing, but it went along the lines of all transportation systems movements will meet the city's standard at level D in the long run. In the long run. Not one member of the PNZ seemed concerned with the statement since none ask a question such as, what is the definition of the long run? What is going on, what is going to happen to our community in the short run? Is the long run 2040 like the fast track train? Or is it 2050? When the annexation application comes to the City Council, I hope you will ask the questions that should be asked. Furthermore, if the answers you receive are not compatible with the best interests of your residents, I hope you will reject the annexation since annexation is at the discretion of the City Council. I believe you will soon be facing a political revolt by your residents if you continue to approve application after application without adequate infrastructure to support the impacts. So that was my original comments. But now, since uh, uh, Dale made some comments per your request about uh, 
gathering lines. And I just wanted to uh, point out a few details that he, he didn't point out. That gathering line that he described goes to the Ryder Well and then south along that utility easement. Very, very, very close to a middle school. Very close to a subdivision. And it serves one well. I would hope that this city council would take it as a very, very high priority to work with whomever you need to work with to get that gathering line abandoned and remove that potential threat to our community as soon as you possibly can. Thank you for your time. Hold on, Gordon. Uh, we are, hopefully. And then, but my question is, what does it mean? Um, what do you, uh, the, the quote you gave about the annexation that all transportations in the system, uh, it, all transportation systems in the long run will be met to a what D standard? A level a D, D? A level D standard. What is which, level D? Which, what, well, that's uh, one level above level F. Oh, okay. In oh, I, I in get trans, it. So in, in other transportation, words, and F is flunking everything. Okay, so, so, so it's not like but, some but, special plan. No, it's no, actually a traditional D. That, that, that is a standard Barely that passing. is accepted. It's in your development code. Okay. But what I'm concerned about is in the long run, all of us who took business classes or economics classes and professors would talk about, well, a business is going to really succeed in the long run. However, it has to survive the short run before it ever gets to the long run. And I just keep playing that in my head as I'm thinking about in the long run. It could be a horrible congestion for all of us until that long run is met. Great. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, come back. <laughs> Councilmember Peck. Thank you. Gordon, I was just going to say thanks for bringing that up. That's always been, for the two years I've been on council, that has been a sticking point with every single development that has come in, is that um, it seems like we, the city, just accepts the developer's traffic study. And especially the, the most recent one was out on uh, County Line 1 when we were putting this huge development out there, and, and I asked, when are we going to reevaluate county line and widen it and it's in the very it's not in the foreseeable future at all but we're putting tons of uh, apartments there and loading cars onto it so um, I thank you for bringing this up I do think it is a problem uh, with our the way we are approaching developments that we don't have better traffic studies that actually meet up with the needs of our city rather than the needs of the of the development alone so thank you for that. Well, I would just add that the traffic study is going to basically give you the counts that are going to be on the roads, but the infrastructure has to be planned and developed to coincide with when that. Otherwise, the traffic study is going to say, yeah, it's going to have so many cars per day, but unless you're programming and have the infrastructure there, all those cars are going to be congested. Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, and I actually have a question not for Gordon, but for the city staff, uh, which is why don't we get a second opinion on the traffic studies as opposed to accepting the developer's analysis? Yeah, Dale. <laughs> uh, Mayor Bagley and Councilmember Martin, the city staff does review the developer's traffic study. It has to meet our... Um, requirements so we don't just um, get them and accept them they have to be reviewed and many times they go back to be done and redone Councilman Martin. and our traffic okay. engineer reviews them as opposed to an independent second opinion I, I was my question <clears throat> I, I what I would say is that certainly the city could farm that work out to another consultant um, to to have it looked at um, I do believe our staff is quite capable of looking at a traffic study unless, of course, it's of a magnitude or a complexity that, that um, um, you know, would be beyond their capabilities. But, um, I, 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 and I think we have that option, frankly. If, if something comes in that is so, so large or, or, or difficult, I think we can always farm it out for a consultant to um, take a look at it. But, you know, we'd take the council's direction. If you if you believe that you would want us to do that, typically that's certainly something that could be 
considered. Okay. Just keep the floor. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm just wondering whether um, how far the analysis goes. I mean, uh, you're going to begin with some data about arrivals and departures, and you know, trip frequency and stuff that is provided by the developer and what reason do we believe, do we have to believe that that's a correct analysis, um, you know, even correct premises? Uh, I'm, just, I'm just wondering how, how independent a review really is as opposed to, you know, taking the occupancy and the development sure. and, and existing traffic and starting from scratch. So one of the things I would offer or suggest is a couple of things. One is um, we could certainly at a study session come back and have uh, Tyler Stamey, our traffic engineer, talk with you about those very issues. Um, we could also um, uh, represent the city's um, master road plan that shows the um, build out of the city's entire transportation system between now and 2035. Some of you have seen that. Some of you have not seen that because you weren't on council at the time that the study was completed. So maybe it, it would be good to have a transportation discussion night to look at all those issues. And if that would be helpful, we can certainly uh, plan to do that as well. And, and then you could ask the traffic experts, Tyler, that, th those kinds yeah. of questions. Um, I think that's a good idea. Let's, <coughs> um, if there's consensus, we should plan to do that. Um, and maybe I would sure. like to add that the topic of a mitigation plan um, because in addition to the congestion areas that, that Gordon mentioned, uh, there are a few more on the southeast side yes. that really deserve to be listed Several too. areas. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> We'd be happy to do that. And okay. um, uh, we, we've also found it to be really effective to sometimes do those as pre-session discussions where we can really get into the details of things around a table and, and council can really grill us and question us. So we'll do it however y'all want to do it, but let us know okay. and we'll, we'll get that scheduled. We could even do it some Friday morning there real you go. soon yeah. now. <laughs> Thanks. Council Member Finley, did you have a comment or question? Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I would just say that education on what actually occurs now I mm -hmm. think is needed mm -hmm. for council members to actually understand what we do mm -hmm. uh, because I don't believe there's a full understanding of how those traffic studies are looked at or who does it. So it'd be good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Your Thanks. five minutes is up. Uh, Mr. Strider, Arkansas, Benston. Well, thanks, sir. Mayor Bagley, Council, Strider, Benston. Um, I love this city. Uh, it's a little short of perfection. We keep discussing that, but uh, uh, I, as often is the case, I have agreed with almost everything I've heard tonight, and uh, that's powerful. Um, I think Crystal was set up as a sacrificial lamb for the city. A lot of people made mistakes, legal errors. They were true errors, but why hang her and, uh, you know, and uh, obviate uh, kind of what the overall problem was, uh, as uh, Ms. Georgette uh, indicated. There were real problems. There should have been figured out a way to deal with it rather than just uh, hanging somebody. Um, I uh, uh, appreciate the Cocoa thing. I've known several young men, boys, uh, who committed suicide recently. All of them happen to be 19 years of age. Um, we have 65,000 deaths in the country from opioid uh, uh, problems, some of them prescription, and maybe three or four deaths per year of some relation to marijuana. So what do we have? The attorney general of this country who invests in private prisons. He wants to recreate the drug uh, war against people who, uh, who, who have uh, uh, pot, uh, create pot prisons where he can make 
tons and tons of money off of imprisoning more people, and of course people who are immigrants and DACA kids. So uh, keep that on your mind as to what the heck is going on in this world. Um, our president uh, last week again proved he's the most racist president ever since Andrew Jackson. Also the most vile and profane and kleptocrat. Um, but uh, even Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina uh, previously called the president, I quote him directly, the president is a xenophobic race baiting bigot. But then he played golf with him and he passed a tax thing for his billionaire body, so he's okay now. But even Lindsey Graham could not abide what happened this week and um, where the president made the most vile racist characterization of one-third of the human race. And now countries all over the world are uh, reacting to that. Uh, maybe belatedly, but uh, that's what we're dealing with. We have an administration where even the concept of truth has been obviated. Even truthiness is now considered too great a burden for the president and his sheep. But um, a couple days ago, I gave uh, Martin Luther King's sermon at UCC here in Longmont, and some of you folks came. I thank you greatly. Um, I felt good about it, even though I was tragically disorganized, but I thank you all. Um, but the very next day, um, the Longmont sponsored uh, Martin Luther King celebration, which I had been keynote speaker at the last three years, forgot that I exist. Uh, I can't say it surprised me, but it hurt anyway. Um, so I'll give you a few words from my... Uh, sermon uh, two days ago. Some say, Lord, Lord, what can I do? Me, insignificant, crippled, greedy, frail, and frightened little mold that I am, what can I do? Mohandas Gandhi said, even though the very best that I can do may be woefully inadequate, still I must do what I can. If you discover a little truth Whoever you be, wherever you are, please carry it a little further down the path. Pass it on so that your sisters and brothers may not continue to stumble in the dark. Quoting Martin, the stability of the large world house will involve a revolution of values to accompany the scientific and freedom revolutions. Dispense the profit motive property rights, and machines, which are more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism cannot be conquered. A civilization can flounder as readily in moral and spiritual sorry, bankruptcy Strider. as it can through financial bankruptcy. I hate cutting you off, but I, if I, I don't, I, then... I got through it. I got right, through cool. it. All right, cool. Thanks. Any, uh, and I, I was there, and you did a fantastic job. Uh, on Sunday, so thank you for your for your words. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, Duke Rumley, or Rumley. Okay, Brian Johnston. Yeah, remove the hat. Yeah, sorry, bad hair day. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, my name is Brian Johnston. I live at nine two six Kaufman. Um, for those of you that know, I know most of you, a couple of you I've only spoken to by email or Facebook, but um, I've lived in Longmont two years now while completing my master's in public administration. Um, I've also got a graduate certificate in political science, an undergrad in political science, and another graduate certificate in public management. Um, I attend almost every council meeting uh, in excess of a 90% attendance rate, so I try to keep it as specifically involved as I can. So a couple, little bit of feedback I wanted to give. Um, First, about staff. Um, I'm really impressed with the city of Longmont staff. Um, it, Sean, Harold, Eugene, Jim Golden, always, or uh, the people I pay my electric bill or my next light bill to, all very helpful, very professional. Uh, no complaints at all with staff. Um, I give them an A. 
in terms of infrastructure, I, I'm really impressed with Longmont. Um, yeah, I moved here from Washington, D.C. Prior to that, Tampa, Florida, Miami, Florida, a couple of small towns of Virginia. Um, yeah, I've lived a lot of places, but um, Longmont really is a great city. It's probably my favorite place I've ever lived. And, um, you know, in terms of infrastructure, I thought the Main Street paving project went well. The, the Main Street bridge uh, looks great. I don't know about the financials behind those. I haven't looked into that, but they turned out well. Um, the Sunset Bridge, I think the resilient St. Vrain project's uh, a great endeavor and, and is trucking along. And, uh, and utilities are great in Longmont, um, particularly Nextlight. And I've, I said this last year at the same forum that um, I think Nextlight's one of the greatest municipal accomplishments I've ever run across. I did my thesis on it. Um, it's an incredible thing. Um, you know, besides how good the service is, what is done to competition in the area? I just got a mail, um, a, you know, a flyer, whatever you want to call it, in the mail last week from CenturyLink. Forty nine ninety nine for life, just like uh, Next Light, <laughs> except you get one fortieth of the speed. <laughs> Verizon. Well, in October they were giving away free pumpkins and free Christmas trees in December if you went to Verizon for a to pay more for slower speed. Next Light is phenomenal. It makes me, aside from the citizens, I think it's the greatest asset that this city has. It's a phenomenal thing. I didn't want to, however, bring up a concern with it. I know that they recently partnered with Layer 3 to provide television service. I also know that Layer 3 was recently purchased by CenturyLink. Is that correct? It's not Aaron? Or Level 3? Layer 3 Level 3. Two separate. Okay. I just ran across this a couple of days ago. It concerned me. Thanks for the clarification. We'll skip that part. Awesome. Just and make sure you protect Next Light. Understand it's part of LPC, which is part of the city's charter or, or constitution. Um, I've also lived in places that had the same thing with electric, and somehow Duke Power ended up getting their hands on it. Just protect Next Light at all cost. Uh, in terms of parks and rec, I haven't visited them all, but it seems like a very good parks and rec, uh, you know, operations within the city. Um, there are a couple of things I did want to bring up about that. I mentioned this in October. I realized now that was real bad timing with the elections and a change in council. But um, the skate park at Sandstone, I'd like to suggest it be named after a guy I've never met, but a gentleman by the name of Joe McLaren, a seven-time consecutive world champion in skateboarding. He does the slalom skateboarding, but he's a seven-time consecutive world champion. I thought it'd be a nice gesture to name the city's only skate park after him because that's a phenomenal accomplishment. Um, I do want to bring up something about golf. You are you're in the you know, upcoming budget that will, like aug around August, that, that you'll be looking at next year's budget. It's projected that there's going to be a, um, a proposal for a $25 million bond for irrigation for golf courses. It's been, you know, it's projected 2019, it's last two budgets. I just want to urge you to use extreme caution on spending $25 million for irrigation on a sport that is rapidly dying. I play golf. I grew that up. Games, that game saved the free world this well, week, though. <laughs> now, you know, I, I grew up on a golf course. Ninth hole is my backyard. And you all want to go out and take me out on a golf course? I'll spank you and take your money on the golf course. However, $25 million over 20 years for irrigation for a sport that's declining in popularity, you need to look at policy alternatives. I don't know what those will be. Perhaps turning Sunset into an open space, which has cost, but longer, some initial cost, but in the long run shorter, whatever. I would consider policy alternatives my only suggestion. Um, and lastly, that's it. Thank we'll you, Brian. You guys do a good job, and we appreciate you. Although the first, you know, you were so positive that, you know, this is the first time I'm thinking, we should just let him keep talking. Longmont's great. Yeah. Yeah. But, all right, Zachary, do you, uh, Harold, yeah, sure, come on up. Mayor Council, the, the total bond is $25 million. The Goff irrigation piece is a smaller portion of that, which is slightly it's around two, slightly less than two million. So it's the total bond for all of the projects is twenty five million. No, for the entire city. So it's twenty five million for the whole list of parks that bond for parks and rec? No, we have a list of projects that includes include some building improvements and, and, and other activities. Those are the building improvements like new fence or golf course or 
No, no, that's only that's only part of it. Um, Jim has a full list, but what we included in that was um, maintenance on on a lot of our facilities. Um, golf was a small piece of that, and that was the irrigation system. Yeah. Around two million. All right, thank you. Thanks. Yet again, another example of our awesome, knowledgeable staff. Yeah. Indeed. All right. <laughs> Uh, reduced it from tw by 90 percent 30 seconds the public asks man we answer all right Zachary Botkin I don't have a speech prepared like all these guys it's okay um I've lived in Longmont a little over like that? Yeah. Oh, I hate the sound of my own voice, but Beautiful. okay. Don't worry. Um, I've lived in Longmont a uh, little over ten years now, and uh, I consider it my hometown, even though I've. Well, it's pretty much the only city I can remember. Nice town. I would, uh, as I said, I don't have a speech prepared like these guys, so I just have a few thoughts. Um, could you tell me what? You guys consider our relationship to the city of Boulder is? Who'd like to answer? <laughs> Council, member, Council member Martin. All right, well, she, she said neighbor. I guess I, I, the, what I would say is uh, Zan Jones is their mayor. Um, and uh, just uh, I consider her and her council and the city allies in many issues, whether it be oil and gas development or whether it be uh, affordable housing, um, we very much share fast tracks. Um, I also, they're becoming an ally, I hope. So uh, we share a lot of the same desires. We live, I mean, we're, we're truly next door neighbors, and what's good for them is good for us, and what's good for us is good for them, at least in theory. And so uh, also uh, part of the family, we're, you know, we're, we're colleagues and allies with Boulder County Commissioners as well as the uh, other cities in Boulder County, like Louisville and Lafayette and Superior. So uh, I guess that that's kind of our relationship, even though a lot of times your people say, we don't want to be Boulder. I mean, we're not Boulder, of course, but they're, they're our friends and allies. Yes, well, I, well, I I'm always have this feeling that uh, Boulder considers us to be maybe sort of a suburb of them, considering I... I have a feeling that whole, the whole north, uh, the whole southwest part of Longmont, is suburbans who uh, commute to Boulder and back, and they would uh, just like people to like not not let them push us around, if you know what I mean. So, um, as you said, we're not Boulder, and I just like you guys to remember that. Well, that, that, that's great. And I can, I can tell you, as I look around at my fellow council members, I, I can't think of a one that would put up with anybody <laughs> pushing them around. The, uh, but thank you. Thank you. That's all I had to say. Okay, thank you. And I don't know your name, sir, but I could overhear when you came up. Yep, come on up. I don't know your name, but if you could say your name and address for the record, we would love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Unless it's really mean, at which point, no, but we'll listen anyway. Stuart Snow, 8487 Greenwood Drive. Um, I'm here to urge you to approve on, as quickly as you can the Kokua Drug Treatment Facility. If I can just quote very briefly from the Wall Street Journal, January 5th, Colorado has the highest rate of first-time youth marijuana use in the country. According to Smart Approaches to Marijuana, cannabis use among young people has increased by 65% in Colorado since legalization. The crime rate in Colorado has increased 11 times faster than in other large cities since legalization. Drug driving facilities doubled in Washington following legalization. Positive drug tests for marijuana in 2016 increased at more than double the rate in Colorado and Washington as nationwide. In January 14th, the government tallied 63,600 overdose drug deaths in 2016, another record. Most of the deaths involved prescription opioids such as Oxycontin and Vicodin. You know, we have professionals experience bringing their own money 
building a facility in our neighborhood to treat these serious problems that we are going to face. And the statistics are there, the opioid crisis is there, the increased use of marijuana among our teenagers. I cannot think of any reason why you wouldn't embrace them and get them here as quickly as possible, particularly given the risk that they might go somewhere else. Why don't we want this in our neighborhood? I just wanted to make that statement. I urge you to, to embrace this facility, to do all you can to get it here to help them to be there because it's something we need, we'll love in our community when we need it. Um, I don't know what time you came to council meeting, but council member Peck asked us to put it back on the agenda and the prevailing party. The last vote said, sure. So we'll be talking about it again in a Just couple of days. Just wanted to tell you I supported it. All right, great. Thank you. Council member Peck. Uh, sir. sir, what publication did you just quote? Wall Street Journal. Wall Street. Uh, uh, what issue? Do you remember what issue that was in? I'll, I'll give you my paper if you want it. But, uh, <laughs> okay. January 5th. January 5th. Okay, And January you. 14th. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Now, I can send them to you if you want them. No, I'll find it. Thanks. Um, that's it for the people who signed up. Is there anyone else who'd like to come up and talk, question, or yell at us as a group or individually? No? Oh. All right, all right. Farnsworth, 25 College Court. Mayor, Mayor, Councilman, one thing that I just came to mind that I just found out uh, Sunday, that the uh, bus service for handicapped has been discontinued on Sundays. We will fill. Uh, one, of our, uh, one of the church members that I go to uh, has been coming every Sunday uh, with the, uh, I'm not sure which service, but they're there uh, every Sunday. And well, yeah, I see, I see confused looks on our city management, and I think that Phil, who's in charge of transportation, isn't here, but we'll check up with him. Okay. And, and uh, uh, if you could also give a name, and, and I mean, just later, if you could give one of us um, the details we can follow up and super and ask. thank you all right great all right let's go ahead and move on to uh, mayor and council comments okay nothing all right sorry mayor pro tem christensen sorry i'm sorry i'm not feeling very well tonight but um we had a, uh, there was a wonderful presentation over at Silver Creek Academy, and uh, I missed Strider's participation particularly, but it was a wonderful program. And uh, it was mentioned that in uh, Dr. King's last book, which was called Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? He said, we will either live together as brothers or die as fools. I think that's... Um, Something we should all remember and listen to each other a little more and be more compassionate. All right. I guess uh, one thing, um, one thing that I'd like to bring up tonight is so I was at my first uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus, and uh, typically you don't bring this stuff up, but I'd like uh, input. And I've already talked to Harold. Um, the Metro Mayors consists of the 40 mayors of the Denver Metro area in Longmont as always, is the end of the line. It's the northernmost city. And my, uh, uh, the, the, the group acts with consensus, meaning the whole group has to agree, and, and then they'll, they'll petition and lobby the state legislature or various bodies. Um, there is currently an issue before uh, the caucus that basically is asking the question, should I um, support or get behind a uh, sales tax, a statewide sales tax for transportation, meaning building uh, and strengthening our infrastructure. Uh, there is no doubt and no question a need for, for the infrastructure. Uh, my comment, along with the mayors of Superior, Louisville, Lafayette, and even Mayor Jones out of Boulder, was uh, last time we came together and got behind it, we got burned on fast track and the RTD routes. And so doing it again um, might uh, 
might be a little stupid until we either get what we had before or a guarantee this time that it's not going to happen again. And uh, we kind of left that meeting. Um, uh, I just I, I made Longmont's presence known. Let's just put it that way. Uh, I know you'd expect nothing less. So I just want your thoughts before I respond. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forward the email to uh, uh, city staff and uh, you folks as well. But your thoughts, uh, Councilmember Finley. Just take you in order. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I would be in favor of that because it's a statewide tax, and hopefully, not just fast tracks was for just the metro area. This is a statewide tax, I believe, that's being proposed, so it wouldn't have that same danger. Danger. So I'd be in favor of it. Council Member Peck. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that this is being sponsored. This initiative is being sponsored by the. Denver Metro Mayor's Chamber of Commerce. No, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. The, the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce is funding the initiative and uh, putting, getting input as to what's to be on the initiative. Uh, they are actually bypassing legislature and Senate since it failed last time, so it'll be a petition <laughs> gathering initiative. They'll have to get signatures in order to put it on the ballot. So uh, I'm in favor of, favor of what we're asking really is that some of the money, perhaps a half a half a percent for not just the Northwest Corridor and Fast Tracks, but the unfunded corridors, because there are four, four corridors and counties that are, uh, that are not funded. Um, and Fast Tracks suffered what everybody else did, that during the recession, People didn't spend money, so we didn't get the retail sales tax in. And with the online shopping, we're not getting any uh, sales tax there. So we're really behind in, in financing it. So um, I'm definitely behind this. It, also, if we don't put on the initiative that it should be all the unfunded corridors, we won't get the support of the other counties if they think they're just, if, they're, if we're only asking for one part of the corridor to be funded. So we have to ask for everything that hasn't been unfunded in order to get the signatures and the votes. Does it, so, does it change your mind at all? So the, the presentation showed that a 1% sales tax had 56% 56, 56 support. I'm sorry, uh, one half percent set, one, one half of a cent for every dollar, or one half percent had 56% support throughout the state, and then 50, it dropped to 53% at 1%, and it's the entire state. So right. it wouldn't be just be the, the fast track the community district, right. It would be all, all the state. Does right. that change your thoughts at all? No, not okay. at all. Um, because it's being sold as a regional, not only a regional, but a connecting transportation initiative to fix all the roads, to fix uh, to a large amount going to I-25, and a large amount to the rural areas who never get anything for their roads. Right. So um, Boulder County is so, do, seems to be so anti-taxes for transportation that we feel that if they don't get something in this initiative, it would be very hard to get the support of Boulder County. So... Yes, I'm in favor of it. All right, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I want to thank uh, Councilwoman Peck for her years of work on this issue and also uh, to Mayor uh, Bagley for actually wrestling together these people and getting them to speak up because, you know, until we say no, we're, gonna, we're not going to get <laughs> roped into another thing when we have already done this. And it was also presented as a regional thing, and it has not been a regional thing. It has benefited Denver inordinately. And uh, that's fine, but we also now need to benefit from this. And um, I'm, I'm all for what you suggested. I think this is a very good idea to, to stand firm and say, you, you've got to work on this a little bit more. And uh, we need to be included. Yeah, thank you. Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I, in particular, would like to see that we have a clear statement of objectives because I don't believe that the future of transportation can be easily uh, 
public transportation in particular can be easily determined at this time. And I want to understand what they think they're going to do and what methods they're going to use to decide what the best way forward um, is so that we don't end up with an antiquated system. Councilman Rodriguez, you want to say anything? Yeah, I'll just chime in a second, I guess. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. No problem. Looking out for you, buddy. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I guess I would like also to see a little bit more detailed analysis and information on it. But at the end of the day, with all due respect to what I feel are very, very uh, adequate, if not great, uh, local state legislators here uh, in our area specifically, I wouldn't mind seeing a little bit of a workaround and letting the, the will of the people and the voice of the people truly start to dictate the way our funding is, is allocated. And I believe this is an issue that our rural neighbors oftentimes are, are neglected in. And so allowing a, a statewide vote or, or support, supporting an initiative for a statewide vote is very much on, on my uh, preferred, preferred list. So I, I would be in support simply for that matter alone. Okay, thank you. And, and my, I guess my, just so you guys know where my thoughts are right now, was just eventually support it, but just be real loud with our neighbors to let them know that we want to, we, we, we don't want to keep funding their trains. So anyway, um, uh, Harold, anything? Eugene, any comments? All right, with that, uh, good forum, good forum. We're adjourned. <laughs>